Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Raiders Workshop. I'm Christine and I'm here with John. Hey, John. Hello. Okay, this week is my turn. I picked a story called Griffin by Charles Baxter. There is definitely a reason that I came across this and I cannot for the life of me now remember, but I have a feeling it was because I had been looking for something to like share in our Facebook group, which you should all join. And this was probably one that I had like Googled and it was recommended or whatever, but I ended up sending it to you like more than a month ago now <laughs> without even reading it. I was just like, uh, I should read this one. I'm being told to read this one by the internet. So that's how I came across it. But I really liked it. There was not a sound in the classroom except for Miss Ferenci's voice and Donna DeShano's coughing. No one even went to the bathroom. Beethoven, she said, had not been deaf. It was a trick to make himself famous, and it worked. As she talked, Miss Ferenci's pigtail swung back and forth. There are trees in the world, she said, that eat meat. Their leaves are sticky and close up on bugs like hands. She lifted her hands and brought them together palm to palm. Venus, which most people think is the next closest planet to the sun, is not always closer. And besides, it is the planet of greatest mystery because of its thick cloud cover. I know what lies underneath those clouds, Miss Frenchie said and waited. After the silence, she said angels. Angels live under those clouds. She said that angels were not invisible to everyone and were in fact smarter than most people. They did not dress in robes as was often claimed, but instead wore formal evening clothes as if they were about to attend a concert. Often angels do attend concerts and sit in the aisles where, she said, most people pay no attention to them. She said the most terrible angel had the shape of the sphinx. There is no running away from that one, she said. She said that unquenchable fires burn just under the surface of the earth in Ohio and that the baby Mozart fainted dead away in his cradle when he first heard the sound of a trumpet. She said that someone named Narzim al Harandim was the greatest writer who ever lived. She said that planets control behavior and anyone conceived during a solar eclipse would be born with webbed feet. I know you children like to hear these things, she said, these secrets, and that is why I am telling you all this. We nodded. It was better than doing comprehension questions questions for the readings in broad horizons. I will tell you one more story, she said, and then we will have to do arithmetic. She leaned over and her voice grew soft. There is no death, she said. You must never be afraid. Never. That which is cannot die. It will change into different earthly and unearthly elements, but I know this as sure as I stand here in front of you and I swear it. You must not be afraid. I have seen this truth with these eyes. I know it because in a dream God kissed me. Here. And she pointed with her right index finger to the sides of her head below the mouth where the vertical lines were carved into her skin wow 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 crazy yeah so like i said i didn't know anything about this when i picked it and um when i started reading it it reminded me a lot of uh the school by oh yeah the bartleby story yeah that uh, bartleby yeah uh, like year like a year ago now and um there's something about how it kind of captured that innocence and and the power of like a classroom right where you get a bunch of naive little kids together and the things that they don't know become even greater right i mean they take on this kind of like mist to them right so this is a teacher that for the main character has been in his mind for years and years like the story is kind of like told after the fact but you don't really know he's probably telling it as an adult but we don't really get like a whole lot of details from him he's definitely telling it though as it having been this like standout memory in his school career just like the school was probably like a a banner year right it's all about how like kids started dying and and the hamster was dying and then a dog died it was weird it was weird but this life-size hamster walked into the classroom yeah yeah, at the end it was like what (laughs) oh that story was good i'm gonna have to reread it but but this one is more like kind of grounded in something that could happen right where you get this just off the wall substitute teacher that blows your mind and obviously the takeaway is kind of that you know they learned something even if they learned what she's terming a different set of facts but um they're learning about life or about curiosity or wonder or places they've never heard of or even if their takeaway is to decipher between truth and falsehood here they were just taken by her and it seems like that was kind of what school is supposed to be about so that section that I read kind of gives you a flavor of what it was like to be in this teacher's classroom. So did you like it? Oh yeah. I um, read this story like a few weeks ago and then reread it yet last night and uh, it's gripping it. I stayed with it. And um, like the passage you read is just one of the times when she sits there doing her monologue. And I love the way those are written. It's just like, she said this, she said this, and she said this, and she said that. It's just this 
like litany of weird, fa- like weird factoids. And by factoid, I mean like things that you don't know whether they're true or false. Right. Yeah. It's really good. She kind of had like that, uh, like the magic school bus teacher vibe to her where she's like kind of flighty and the things that are taking place in this classroom are like obviously not possible, but you're learning so much and, and the kids are just having a blast. And I mean, they can, they kind of hit you over the head with it. They say things like we memorize those multiplication tables, but this is what I remember more. So it's kind of like over it that way. And then in, like, it's called the Griffin because it's one of the things that she spends some time describing this half bird, half lion. And to prove, to decide whether or not this is right, the kid opens up the dictionary and looks it up and and finds a drawing, which is adorable because um, one of his other barometers in the story is the National Enquirer, which he sees like at the grocery store. And it's 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 just funny. (laughs) Yeah. And the kid's like, you're right. I've seen it. And so they're, they're like solidifying these facts for themselves. When he looks it up in the dictionary, it's, it describes a griffin as a fabulous beast and his reaction is something like, oh, that's, it is fabulous. Fabulous. This does sound fabulous. Yes. Failing to know the uh, alternate <laughs> version of definition of fabulous. Exactly. Like, it's just so cute. And she didn't make it up, right? I mean, it's in the dictionary too. So it might be fabulous, but it wasn't of her mind. Yeah. So what kind of happens at the end there? And I don't know if it's like the takeaway or not, but she ends up getting the boot because (laughs) one of her last, her last time um, teaching the kids, she reads their futures with a deck of tarot cards and the death card comes up and I've gotten the death card and they all tell you the same thing. It doesn't mean death. It means something else. And so she tells this little kid who gets the death card that like he's going to die young. But, yeah, I, but yeah. it's gonna be great <laughs> yeah she's like but you know death is just the end of something and the beginning of something else and she doesn't do much to comfort this kid like you might an adult even and obviously the kid goes and tattles and she <laughs> drives off while they're like at recess it's very funny but the kid the narrator and i i read this kind of like in some criticism i read after the fact like i noticed it but i didn't understand its significance until it was like pointed out again but the narrator says like you know and then she read my fortune and then she read the next fortune that he completely glosses over his even though he presumably in the future can tell us whether or not any of this came to pass right that doesn't seem to be the point it seems to be sort of like the card he's holding close to his chest so that we as the reader can decide whether or not we believe this woman right because he's not going to tell us one way or the other if it panned out but that passage that i just read talks about death and so this is before the tarot card incident but she says like don't worry like nothing that's alive can ever die and like what a beautiful thing to learn and to be told if you really are hearing it. But then uh, so funny that, you know, a couple days later, well, months later, this kid has completely forgotten that lesson, right? Because now his own mortality hangs in the balance. And it was pretty funny, but also um, you get the sense that she was probably like a very, she was a good person, like a caring person. She doesn't want this kid to feel like he's going to die. She doesn't think anything can die. So it's it was a funny read. It was like lighthearted, but it delved into like so many deep topics. I think that's something that like a classroom setting probably always does right there's always going to be like the spit takes and like slapstick stuff right with kids who are gross and weird and naive but then there's also this capacity for like real deep moments right because at every turn they're losing some you know naive thought that they had they're they're growing up before your eyes in every one of these stories so like what a great ploy as a writer so borrow me is the school was it was more or less the it was third person it wasn't close but it was more or less the point of view of the teacher if yes. I remember right and this one is the point of view of sort of a specific student who's uh, pretty young right but like you said is looking back on it it makes me think of that when we um, had Carl on the podcast and we talked about a and p and we were talking about stories written from a kid's point of view and um, people react to those really uh, interestingly you know like you can't use a big word because no kid would know a big word or stuff like that it's kind of sometimes the commentary on those are pretty lame but <laughs> I wrote a story a novel is meant for adults but when I send it to an agent they're like oh this is a YA book I was like no just because the kid is like 15 it doesn't mean that it's a YA book right so I like it for um being an adult story that has, is centered around kids. And I think that's really important sometimes for us to have stories that are about kids that we can read as adults. Yeah. There's stuff to learn there. The way I've always like thought about YA and it's not right necessarily, but because I've, I've struggled to like, um, sometimes we'll get like direct questions from people in, in the group. Like, is this YA? Should I, should I really lean into the YA? And I'm like, I don't know what that means to you, but like to me, YA means like, it's easy to understand. It's straightforward. It's, it's the opposite of what we talk 
talked about in our last episode, which is this uncovered complex meaning that you can only hope to understand after hearing the experts tell you what you missed. So (laughs) yeah, like YA is more like straight to the point, like, and it's, it can be complex in terms of what's actually happening. If it's a serious plot, if it's, you know, flashbacks, if it's like told in past tense or whatever. And, and this will become very clear to you if you pick up something like the boxcar kids, right? That's a chapter book for children, right? It's not necessarily YA that we think about now, which is more what geared towards like middle schoolers, high schoolers, but they're not pulling any punches then, you know, it's just like Sally went and did this. Sally went and did that. This happened next. There's foreshadowing, there's tension, there's like rising action and all that kind of stuff, but they want you to get it. That's why one of the problems is within the past 20, 30 years, the distinctions among categories of like, there's why there's middle grade, there's, 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 I can't even list them all. There's so many and they're creating new one for like post YA, but pre adult, I think, or maybe there's one before YA, but anyway, they're splitting these categories in smaller and smaller sections. When I was a kid, I read Beverly Cleary and uh, like Ramona. I read all the Ramona books when I was a kid. They were what we'd call chapter books, right? Which is just kids books that are chapters. And then when I got older, I didn't read YA books because there was no such thing. I just read books. Right. <laughs> the point of that is that I think the categories are just, the people are just making things up and inventing categories because they're trying to like corner a market. Yeah. I think that has a lot to do with it, right? Like if we do call it a certain genre and then we can market it that way, then we have a better chance of making money. And that unfortunately makes writers want to define their works before they're done. I'm like, just fucking write it. Yeah. I always thought that's what the agent's job was supposed to be. It's like, I right. don't care what this is. You agent, go sell it. <laughs> yeah. Obviously nowadays people are like, my YA novel will have 80,000, you know, like now they do it themselves like in query letters, yeah, but it's good to do that. It's not, it I, is. Uh, yeah. I just feel like at the outset, it hurts the craft. Like, you don't need to worry about that when you're putting the first words down. Yes. It shouldn't affect your approach. And obviously with a story like this, I don't think it had anything to do with it, right? No, no. I'm just pointing out that grown-up people like to read about kids too. Yes. Not everything that has a kid in it is geared for children. No. And maybe like the difference, if we really had to find one, is kind of like if it's told about kids as it's happening to kids, or if it's told like this with like a kind of hindsight, which is maybe more enjoyable for an adult than it might be for a kid. Right. You don't want to hear like Harry Potter told as an adult, like, oh, and I was so stupid when I went into the Chamber of Secrets. I was being such an idiot. Like... (laughs) Harry Potter when he's like 47 at a bar telling his stories. He's like, I want to bang her honey, but I screwed the pooch. Yeah, just there's something like more immediate when it happens, like in the present, right? Mm -hmm. It Like only what's happening right then matters. We don't have to worry about what we're going to think about it later. Okay, so this is my other like uh, grand takeaway, which which if in keeping with our theme about literary criticism these last two episodes, if I was going to wow all of you and tell you that you missed some big theme, it would be that <laughs> that this teacher is like a Christ figure, right? And wow. yes, and that like all of these students are these disciples or the public that are like, she's full of shit. And these kids pick camps and they really stick to them. And this narrator for us is like, she's absolutely right. She's She's telling the truth and he keeps saying you're all just afraid you're just afraid there's this scene where he's yelling at his friends and he's like you're afraid but she's right and so when she drives away in her car that's her death that's her getting crucified because yeah. the kid that got freaked out about his tarot card reading was judas and ratted him out he's like this teacher is messed up get her out of here and i think it's kind of told in the sense that like this kid is looking back on it and thinking like she was right about so much even if she lied about griffin she was right about so much that has stuck with me right and maybe it takes like (laughs) a Christ figure to die on the cross for our sins for it to be like realized, right? Like maybe if she hadn't been exercised from this school, he wouldn't have thought so much and looked so so hard back on, you know, why it was that people rejected her and what she was saying specifically. But you know how like when kids get in little gangs like uh, Lord of the Flies, right? They can get real vicious. And that's kind of what it felt like at the end. There are these little camps of people that were like, 
I don't know. And no, she's full of it. And I'm going to tattle. And then there's this narrator. He was one of the staunch defenders. He was a believer in the, in this woman. And there's something so cute about that, right? He couldn't understand what the adults were doing, but he felt it was wrong. Yeah, I loved it. He's like, um, he beat someone up over it at the end. Yeah, there's something really sweet about it. Wayne fell at me, his two fists hammering down on my nose. I gave him a good one in the stomach and then I tried for his head. <laughs> Aiming my fist, I saw that he was crying. I slugged him. She was <laughs> right, I yelled. She was always right. She told the truth. Other kids were whooping. You were just scared, that's all. Yeah, he's he's in the uh, he's bought into it, right? Mm -hmm. And we also don't get to hear like if Wayne died early. <laughs> I was a little bummed about that, but he killed him on the playground there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She was right, Wayne. <laughs> this is it. Yeah, I don't know. This is this is like one of those ones where if I think about the title again in a couple months, like I'll, I'll have like a fond kind of memory about it. And maybe this is stealing your takeaway, but you're right. I had a fiction professor once who had us write a story for that week. The assignment was to either write about a child or, or an animal because he said that those were two of the things that were like most often like stereotyped or kind of glossed over in fiction, which of course, if it's YA, they're not being glossed over. But as like a secondary character, um, mm -hmm. they can be. And and so that was the assignment. And since then, I've always thought like, I never felt like I shouldn't be writing about kids or that they were boring or anything. But it's just like, you know, if your first instinct is to write about a character like mine is, who looks like me and acts like me and talks like me, you know, and is my current age, like maybe, maybe, maybe you just need to like stretch a little bit and think about, you know, what it would be like to write about kids. Because to your point, doesn't matter how old we are, there's stories there that we will enjoy. It does not make your writing YA. Yeah. Did I steal your takeaway? No, no. I, in <laughs> fact, I did not write it down a takeaway, so I, <laughs> I will have to scramble when the time comes. <laughs> yeah. Well, what else did you like about it? Or what else did you want to point out? Well, one thing I should say about this is reading it. This is, and this is just a personal reaction. This kind of builds off what we were talking about the last episode where, you know, the concept of finding the meaning of a story isn't, um, to me, there's nothing, no such thing, but we can think about applicability. And the way I would apply it is my reaction to this teacher is I didn't like her because she was spouting so many falsehoods, right? And this, the concept of what to believe and what, what is true and what is not true is very problematic and um, especially <laughs> in a uh, in a position of power like that when you're a, a teacher so I found myself like cringing at a lot of the stuff she's telling these poor impressionable children and that they're buying into as I was also enjoying the story because it's really it's good it's well told yeah that's interesting I I definitely had that reaction at first because she is there's no inside joke with her she's not winking at these kids you know they're taking her at face value unlike like some adults who might tell fun stories like this, but at some point indicate to these kids like, ah, oh, I'm just joshing, right? She seems to believe this wholeheartedly, which does seem to be damaging, but it also seems to be the only way that this magic kind of takes hold, right? I think the fact that some of her lessons are what we would, you know, this is all spelled out in that six times 11 equals 68, and yeah. she just nods through it, and then they're like, wait, no, he was wrong. Why did you say he was right? It's like, well, maybe he was right, and <laughs> yeah. makes up this gibberish about stuff. So it's kind of spelled out that she doesn't care about what's right and wrong. She doesn't care care about truth and falsehood. Mm -hmm. Well, I just think she has this aura because she she's not faking this role. This is who she really is. She really is this weird. She really is like spouting off things that she, I think, believes. Yes. She's not an adult talking about Santa Claus. She's not trying to get these kids to stretch their minds, right? She's just an odd bird that comes in and then leaves. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's kind of the impact is that this kid is probably for the first time meeting an adult in a position of authority, like you say, that is not like the other adults. And isn't that magical, right? Because he goes to school and he's got this teacher that's like, oh, we're going to talk about bugs today. Did you memorize it? And even at this age, they're used to the routine. And so it's like the break from the routine that is like mind blowing and, and so exciting for them. Yeah, there's something about, you know, especially for kids, I think. And I think for grownups, and this is probably why this is, even though it's about kids, um, I say grownups, I, I use that word more because I have kids now and I talk to them about grown-ups. Grown-ups. Anyone <laughs> taller than you. <laughs> so, but, you know, adults have the same kind of concerns as kids do when it comes to a person who comes in and seems to flout authority, flout like their standard idea of authority and says, oh, 
oh, there's something something going on here. She doesn't care. She's saying things that we've never heard before. And I think maybe that's why it works for, even though it's a kid, the kid in the story, it works for adults. I mean, this, this teacher is as strange as an adult, right? Her presence is not just confounding for the kids. Like she gets booted from the school. <laughs> that's right. So yeah, even adults are like, what is going on with this teacher? But you couldn't put the story in like, for example, like a, a university or something because the students have more, they're adults themselves now. Yeah, they're discerning. So they can push back. Whereas right. At this level, they, they're not going to push back. No, yeah, they're fully captive. I did read some piece that there's there's a couple scenes here where the kid comes home from school and the mom's like, how's school? And she, I think she has the same little routine in each of those scenes where she appears, you know, he just busts through the door and she says, how was school? And he's like, oh my God. He's like, well, let me tell you about this sub. She's nuts. And the mom's like, oh, that's nice. And I read something that, you know, pointed out that the mom is like a direct foil to this teacher for this kid, especially where like he can come home. And even when he comes home, there's like an expectation of what happens next right mom's gonna ask me how school was even though she doesn't care and she's gonna tell me go do my homework and do my chores around the house and then we have dinner and he's like everything is in like stark contrast now to this teacher for him yeah i think the first time he tries to express to his mom how excited he is about all the things his teacher the the substitute told him and then she's like go do your chores and the next time she asks how was school he's like it was all right even though he's in, in his head thinking it was great this teacher was back and she told us all the stuff he knows now that he can't express those things to his mom i thought it was interesting when he says we had this substitute today he's talking to his mother and i'd never seen her before and she had all these stories and ideas and stuff and his mother says well that's good and she's looking at the window (laughs) go upstairs and pick your clothes up off the floor go to the shed and put the shovel and axe away and then he goes on, he's like, she said that six times 11 was sometimes 68. And she said she once saw a monster that was half lion and half bird in Egypt. And his mother says, did you hear me? My mother asked, raising her arm to wipe her forehead with the back of her hand. You have chores to do. I know, I said, I was just telling you about the substitute. It's this irony, maybe, where his mother is asking if he heard her. Yeah, right. She's not listening to anything he's saying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, she's it's just great. like, whatever you're saying is not that important. So do you have a takeaway now that we've bullshitted longer? <laughs> well, I was kind of leaning towards a to- takeaway. My takeaway was going to be uh, something about the prose. Okay. So the sentences when she's talking are, or when when uh, the narration is relaying like her 40 minutes of nonstop talk, it's she talked for 40 minutes straight. There seemed to be less connection between her ideas, but the ideas themselves were, as the dictionary would say, fabulous. <laughs> I love that. And then every sentence is basically, she said, this she said that she right. said this miss friend she said this she didn't say this she said and it's just she said this she said this and every time it's a new topic it's that same because sometimes there's a sentence that kind of expands on the, the what was introduced but or it's like a direct quote or a quote or something like that but so my takeaway is sometimes using kind of repetitive sentence structures can create uh can help drive something forward you know we're usually told vary your sentence structure because it's boring to read the same thing over and over again but you can create a mood with sentence structure when it repeats if you have a similar setup right. and this is meant to be just this like like I, I called it before a litany and if you just start every sentence with the same kind of thing and not every sentence like i said there are in between sentences but kind of every idea starts in the same way you can help create that mood of just thing after thing after thing after thing and goes yeah, on yeah i feel like we talked about that in that one story where the girl was like telling her new girlfriend all about all her past traumas with her trashy family and she just, was just oh, like living stuff river of names yeah yeah so we kind of talked about how on the surface that might look like unimaginative writing styles but it wasn't and it was achieving something so mm-hmm. yeah if you're intentional about it versus when we talk about varying sentence structure it's usually like to snap a, a novice writer out of the habit of what they feel they do well or what they think is accurate or right Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, but once you've graduated, now you can play with words and uh, do that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think that's varying your sentence structure is very important because sometimes we get trapped in the way we talk. and We write the way we talk all the time. So certain people just say sentences in in, in some way. And then when they write things down, they don't think about changing them. So you want to like teach them, okay, writing is different than speaking. 
thing. So you need right. to think about each sentence and the way it's structured. But then we, you know, my takeaway is we don't want to take that too far because we want to use all the tools that are available. And sometimes repetition is a tool. Like if you accidentally repeat a word in two sentences, sure. one after the other, sometimes we revise that out. But sometimes you do want to repeat that word a couple of times to have a resonance. As long as you're being intentional, I think that's kind of the point here, right? Yes, it's you have to do it for the effect that it creates. And usually like what we don't want is for a writing to create effects that we're not intending it to create, which is why we say vary your sentence structure. Otherwise you create this effect you don't want to create, which is this boring litany. But right. You create a boring litany. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Not that it's boring. It's not just anything but. Right. All right. Thanks, guys. If you enjoyed this episode, consider subscribing to our monthly newsletter at our website, NaplesWritersWorkshop.com. And for daily writing tips, industry news, and great short fiction, join our Facebook group at Facebook.com slash groups slash Naples Writers Workshop.